Welcome to the Center of Everywhere podcast, where we explore stories of rural Minnesotans who are making a difference in their communities. Rural isn't in the middle of nowhere. It is in the center of everywhere. Hello, and welcome to the Center of Everywhere podcast by the Center for Rural Policy and Development. Back in January, President and CEO of the Center for Rural Policy and Development, Julie Tesh, had a conversation with Scott McMahon, the Executive Director of the Greater Minnesota Partnership, on the upcoming legislative session. In this episode, Julie brought Scott back for a legisl- mid-legislative session review. And so far, this session has lived up to its unorthodox hype. From a state budget that forecasted a deficit to now a billion-dollar surplus, the interesting legislative interactions due to Zoom meetings, and rural speakers testifying on the need for broadband literally dropping out in the middle of their testimony due to bad internet connections. This session has had it all. Hello and welcome to the Center of Everywhere. My name is Julie Tesh and I'm president and CEO of the Center for Rural Policy and Development. And today our guest is Scott McMahon with the Greater Minnesota Partnership. Hello, Scott. Hey, Julie. How are you? Doing really well. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for coming back. We had you on earlier in the session. And so kind of wanted to do a, not even midway, but a two thirds way through uh, update. So thanks for coming back. Oh, I appreciate it. So let's just jump right in. <laughs> and I know with session, sessions never go how you think they're going to go. Um, but just thinking back to January when we were trying to figure out budget and whatnot, and we still are, what's been your biggest surprise dealing with things in rural? That's an interesting question, Julie. Um, you know, I think the biggest surprise for this session was, has to be the budget turnaround. You know, the last time I was here talking with you, you know, we were talking about a, a $1.2, $1.3 billion budget deficit and how we deal with that and how we get through session. Um, and fast forward into February and the new numbers come out and it's a $1.6 billion surplus. And I think we all anticipated the budget picture getting better um, and possibly closing that budget deficit or maybe providing a slight budget surplus. But I don't know anybody at the Capitol that I've spoken with that anticipated that much of a swing. Um, and so I think that's, for me, that's been the biggest surprise this session. And I know talking with some legislators as well, it obviously nobody wants to have a budget shortfall, but dealing with a surplus is probably more difficult because everybody comes out of the woodwork and everybody wants money, of course. Yeah, yeah. well, and this, uh, this session gets even more interesting from that standpoint because on top of the $1.6 billion budget surplus, we also have $8 billion coming from the federal government from the American Recovery Act funding. Um, and obviously some of that money is dedicated for certain purposes, but you know, there's $2.5, $2.6 billion that's sitting there for the legislature or the governor to do things with. And so um, now the question becomes, what do we spend money on? Which bucket of money is it that's being used for the various things? And, you know, when when you run in these situations, everybody's kind of saying, I want to do these things, but I don't want to do it out of my bucket. I want to do it out of the bucket over here. And so Mm -hmm. the next, uh, you know, we're less than five weeks away from when we have to wrap up the legislative session and the conversation is going to be very, very difficult for the next five weeks. Yeah, it's gonna, it's a marathon. It's, it's going to be, going to be long. I know uh, listening into ag committee, especially the last couple of weeks, because that's where our funding falls in, in one of the buckets, you know, trying to make the difference in legislation, especially of what bucket it falls in. And so I'm glad that I am not in the revisor's office or having to figure out just the wording on everything. Like it use the federal money first, and then you can use this, you know, and just going through a lot of those different situations. And that is, it's, it's very going to be very interesting for the departments to get through that. It is. And, you know, one of the real challenges right now is on all this federal money, we don't have clear guidance as to how those dollars can be used or what it can be used for. Um, So, Mm -hmm. for instance, included in in that eight billion dollars is five hundred and twenty million dollars for child care issues. Very little of that money. Do we uh, do we know yet what it can be? concretely used for. We have some general senses as to what the buckets are and how they can be spent, 
Um, but we're having conversations right now in the legislature about how to spend those dollars without a clear understanding as to what they can be used for. Yeah. So how can you make any decisions? I mean, it, <laughs> you can put, you can put together some ideas, but you just, you just don't know. And do we have any clear, is there any clear cut timeline of when we might find out federally what will happen? You know, <laughs> No, there, there isn't. Um, you know, we just recently, so back in December, we got more childcare money from the feds and we just recently got guidance on those dollars, I want to say in late March. Um, and so it, it's pretty slow coming out of DC as to what these things can be used for. Um, and, and the reality is we're, we're required to adjourn the legis legislature on May 17th. Um, whether we have our work done or not. And so, you know, we have a time crunch coming up. Um, we, uh, we, you know, need to make some decisions. Um, the question would be, will we have the information that we need before we have to be out of here? Good question. <laughs> and I think of too, you know, President Biden just announced his newest uh, infrastructure budget and ideas and you know I was happy to see that there is a nice chunk in there that he's proposing for rural but that is so far down the road you know so it, you think about that and you know I, I'm a former former employee of University of Minnesota Extension so I saw you know oh you know wanting increases in extension and, and research and all of that and I'm like that's great but also don't want to get too excited about it because that is just really down the road a lot. It is. And, and frankly, that conversation in and of itself, I think, is having an issue on the Capitol right now, because that's yet another bucket that folks are looking at saying, we may be getting funds from this effort, you know, at some time in the future. And so we don't need to think about those things. Well, we don't have those dollars. We don't know what it's going to look like. Um, you know, obviously, there's a big discussion in DC on the infrastructure about is it one bill or two bills? Um, if it's two bills, you know, bill one will be more traditional infrastructure things. Bill two will be non-traditional infrastructure things. Um, and so there's just, there's a ton of unknowns right now that are impacting the conversations we're having right now and need to have in the next five weeks. Yeah. It's talking about infrastructure. What are you seeing on broadband? You know, I, I live in rural Minnesota on a farm. I consider broadband infrastructure, just like electricity, but I know that not everyone thinks that. And I know talking with people all over greater Minnesota, they trying to figure out how we solve this problem, you know, because there's local coalitions, there's state coalitions, there's federal things like what, what are you hearing out there? And, and will any progress be getting made? So I think progress will get made. Um, so we've got the, the governor's broadband advisory group kind of monitors this issue on an annual basis and and lays out uh, what the what the expenses need to be and kind of where we are for our goals. And the big goal that we have right now is um, is the 2026 goal, which is and I haven't thought about this for a while, so I think it's a um, hundred download speed, twenty five upload speed. Mm -hmm. uh, that seems right. And in order to get to that level, we need about $120 million this biennium for funding, just kind of keep us on track to get there. Um, right now, it's looking pretty good to get that investment. Um, both the House and Senate committees have passed out bills to provide that level of funding. Um, and so, you know, it's going to be a matter of how conversations go in the coming weeks. Um, the interesting thing is on the Senate bill, their original proposal was $40 million. Um, they added in an additional $80 million during their committee markup a week ago. Um, but that $80 million is contingent in, the, in their language on it being accessible from the federal money, which it is. We know that those dollars are available for broadband right now out of that uh, $2.6 billion that, uh, that the state has received. But these are the kind of things we're dealing with now where people are saying, you know, we're, we're willing to spend X, but only Y of our money and, you know, Z of, mm -hmm. of this federal bucket. And so I think we're going to see a lot of those things uh, going forward. Um, but I do, I am pretty optimistic that we will get a sufficient funding this session for, to keep us on pace for broadband. Now, the reality is between, uh, you know, what we're seeing 
with the funds right now and what we're likely to see from the infrastructure bill coming forward, um, you know, I would rather see them say, you know what, let's just bite this apple right now and fund what we need today to hit the 2026 broadband goal. Because we know that that infrastructure is critical. We know, uh, we know this more and more the legislature now because we have all sorts of greater Minnesota people testifying in hearings who cut out halfway through, <laughs> through their testimony because their broadband <laughs> shuts down. Yeah. Um, and so legislators understand what the realities are of inadequate broadband in greater Minnesota um, and the funds are available. And so, you know, if we're going to do the right thing, let's just get this thing done in 2021 and not try and piecemeal it together between now and 2026. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you bring up a good point about um, legislators getting to witness uh, those of us in rural cutting out and they it's frustrating for them. And like we were talking before, it's very frustrating for us on, on the end in rural. So it's, it's, it's a, I don't want to say a good thing that's come out of, of virtual, but it's get, gotten people to realize that we, this is very important. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, I think I made this comment when we spoke back in January, Julie, um, but one of the things that happened last session uh, because of the COVID pandemic is all of a sudden we started talking about broadband access in a multitude of different committees. It wasn't just the jobs and, jobs and economic development committees. It was in healthcare, it was in education, it was in higher education, because all of these committees were now starting to realize how critical broadband is to the success of the groups that they regulate and fund. Um, and so I think the conversation today is still very different than it would have been two years ago, which is good. Mm-hmm. Um, but we also know that to build out the infrastructure is going to take resources and we need to get those resources in the coffers so that we can do what we need to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's shift to childcare. Um, boy, popular topic, which is good. Um, you know, we've had, we've done a couple webinars on our child care report and have received very good reactions from it. Um, some people are very appreciative of some of the suggestions we've made, but you know, the bottom line is child care affects economic development. And I think that's sure. something that people have realized that, that I guess I don't want to say they didn't realize it before, but they, they took it for granted that, oh, child care will just be there, but now it's affecting jobs mm-hmm. and people not being able to go back into the workforce. And so you know, the media and others are realizing, oh, we're not going to grow our workforce if we don't have adequate child care. So I know there's a few bills uh, in the hopper right now. So why don't you talk about that? Yeah, no, happy to. And, you know, before I do that, Julie, I want to thank you and, and your team for the work that you've done on the recent study. Um, you know, every time that you guys do more research on child care, it opens my eyes up more and more to the realities of what we face. Um, and, and the finding that you all uncovered in the recent report that, that keeps me up at night is the, the loss of childcare license slots that we had between 2000 and 2020. And mm-hmm. the fact that it was entirely family care licenses that we lost made up with a slight increase in, uh, in child care center licenses. And, and for those of you that haven't read the report, please go off and do it. Um, but over that 20 year period, we've lost 20,000 childcare slots in greater Minnesota. We're currently short about 40,000 childcare slots. And so that, that market loss that we had over that 20 year period is, is a significant portion of what's there. And knowing that it was entirely in the family care license, you know, makes us have to stand up and say, mm-hmm. what's happening in the marketplace for childcare? And what is childcare going to look like five years from now in greater Minnesota? versus what has it traditionally looked like. And to me, Mm -hmm. you know, it comes down to two things. We either need to figure out how to make centers work in greater Minnesota, which is very, very difficult, just from an economic standpoint, Mm -hmm. or we need to figure out how we create the right opportunities for family license providers to operate in a way that they're looking for. Um, And frankly, I, I think more and more that it's not the traditional family license childcare center in somebody's basement um, mm-hmm. that we've traditionally had. I think it's going to be something different moving forward and we need to figure out the funding and the regulatory structure around that. So thank you for, for your and your team's work <laughs> Absolutely. on that. Absolutely. Um, yeah. It's been helpful in just helping us frame out kind of what we're seeing 
and being able to talk about it in a more quantified basis. So looking at child care, um, it absolutely is a priority, not only for us and advocating the Capitol, but we're seeing it to be a higher priority um, in both the House and Senate with both Republicans and Democrats. Um, so there's there's a multitude of things being talked about. Um, and you know, part of the issue with child care is it's in a lot of different places. So in the Senate, we talk about child care in the K-12 committee. We talk about child care in the health and human service committees. We talk about child care and the job and economic development committees. Um, in the House, we talk about child care in those same committees. The House also has its own child care committee, um, but it's all of those committees that, that are doing all the work. And so, um, you know, there's no one central place. We also don't have a single state agency that deals with these issues. You know, we have things embedded in human services. We have things embedded, uh, embedded in the Department of Education. And we have, you know, grants and things that are in uh, Department of Employment and Economic Development. And so, you know, I, I think that's one of the fundamental challenges that we see in, in dealing with this issue. Um, but looking at what's happening in this session, uh, you know, as, as you can base off my comments, um, we have proposals coming out of the state's $1.6 billion budget deficit. Uh, and there are things that we've been working on, so we're glad to see some of those things happening. We also have uh, proposals coming forward on how to spend this $520 million in federal money that's come into play. Um, and then we also have some conversations that I think are starting about, well, this $2.6 billion, we wanna spend any of that in childcare. Um, and so we will see some significant investments in childcare just because of the dollars that are on the table. Um, the $520 million, however it gets spent, will have a significant impact in Minnesota. Um, the first thing we need to do is make sure that our providers right now that are in the marketplace are taken care of. Um, if you look back a year ago, childcare shut down in Minnesota as workers stayed home, uh, families pulled their kids out of childcare. Um, you know, providers saw their uh, their enrollments drop by 50, 70 percent. And the reality is, we need all those providers to be there when all of our employers or all of our employees go back to work and need to have a place for them to, to put their kids. Because as we know, childcare is economic development and childcare is workforce. And you know, one of the quotes I've come across recently that, I, that really hits this for me is that childcare is a business that keeps businesses in business and that it is that input, mm. it's that unseen input that every employer relies on um, to make their workforce happen. And so it is, a, it is a critical component of everything that we do. And so, you know, we need to make sure that we have adequate childcare slots there for what our workforce is looking for. And so what's happened over the past year is we have provided just monthly subsidy grants to our childcare providers just to try and keep them in the marketplace to deal with their decreased revenue um, so that they're around when we need them. The reality is those funds have been exhausted a number of times and they've been kind of restarted, um, but we're at the point again where they're exhausted and this $520 million will help refund that pool. And so one of the first things we need to do is get those grants back up and running so that our providers uh, have that revenue coming in, can stay in the marketplace until demand comes back to, to what it needs to be. Um, so that's step one. And step two is for me, what do we do today to make sure that tomorrow is different. Um, and we've got, you know, we've got a few different things during, that are gonna come out of this. One is um, we will see a significant investment in uh, family subsidies, whether it's the child care assistance program or the early learning scholarships. The bulk of that $520 million is gonna go for things like that. And so, um, you know, one of the big questions right now is what does that look like? Uh, what's the distribution between uh, the child care assistance program and early learning scholarships? Um, and, you know, what one of the other big questions is then what happens in two or three years when these dollars are gone um, and how do we backfill or, or keep things going? Um, but again, you know, for me, this comes back to your guys' study where you showed that over that 20 year period, one of the things we saw was stagnation in these subsidy programs and the decrease in their purchase power that we can't let happen again. Um, and so our hope is that we can kind of show over the next two to three years what happens when we more adequately fund child care for families uh, the way that it needs to be. Um, the other thing that needs to happen is for greater Minnesota, 
is when when you look at greater Minnesota, um, it's a huge geographic area. You know, one of the things that I often say when I'm presenting to groups and trying to paint the picture of what greater Minnesota is, um, is that you can take a day and you can drive from Grand Portage to Laverne, or you can drive, and it's usually in the Twin Cities, so you can drive from St. Paul, Minneapolis to Chicago and catch the first six and a half innings of the Cubs game because it's an adequate amount of time to do those two things. And so one of the challenges that we have with child care in greater Minnesota is that our providers don't have access to the support services, whether it's training, whether it's technical assistance for business development, um, whether it's licensure support or whatnot that they need. And so one of the things that we've been advocating for for the past few years is let's get more of those wraparound services more readily available to our providers. Um, and so we have been advocating for, uh, for two different proposals. One is funding to our six initiative foundations throughout Greater Minnesota, who have been doing this work for a number of years, um, but to do more of it <laughs> for more communities and more providers. And so um, included in, uh, in the House bill is $2 million for the initiative foundations and including the Senate bill is $3 million for them. Uh, those dollars, if, if we can get them, will provide a significant boost in those wraparound services we can get for providers. Um, there's also in the House bill, uh, $10 million for grants at the, at the Department of Employment and Economic Development to do similar kind of things. And so there's a recognition that yes, in greater Minnesota and in the Twin Cities too, you need to provide these wraparound services for, uh, for providers. And then the third thing that we need to look at is um, how do we build out new childcare? We know we're short these 40,000 childcare slots. We know in greater Minnesota, the childcare marketplace is broken. Too often I hear from providers, um, you know, I can't make a business model that actually generates a profit or frankly doesn't even generate a break even point. And so we need to figure out how do we bend that cost curve or how do we change the, the market for them so that they can be a successful business. And one of the things that I've heard from, uh, from child care center directors is I can build a successful business model that either allows me to pay my employees or to pay my mortgage, but I can't do both of them. So uh, we have... We have a proposal that we've worked on for a couple of years now um, that would create a child care facilities capital grant program to provide access to capital that isn't there in the private sector in greater Minnesota to help us build out um, child care facilities. And so there's money in both the House and Senate to do this kind of work. Um, the House has $5 million in their bonding bill that they just announced this week. Um, the Senate has $50 million in their bill to allocate the $520 million for, uh, for child care facilities. And so, you know, we're optimistic that we're going to see something on that, but we think if we can kind of move the three dials of how do we put more revenue into the system, how do we provide more wraparound services, and how do we provide capital for expansion, that we can start to solve the child care problem in greater Minnesota. Absolutely. And that brings up a good point. I know one of the things we brought up in our study as well is one of the questions we ask that needs to be solved is, is child care a business or is it education or is it both? What is it? Because the way that it's being funded is not working. And then you have regulations that some see are too onerous. And so it's trying to figure that out because I think there's so many child care providers and so many people just in general that never thought of child care as a business, as an industry. And then you also compound on that the fact that there's not people going into it. Once somebody is done with family child care, they're done, you know, or with center child care, trying to get um, people to work there. We had, we uh, hosted or we spoke yesterday on a, a panel discussion talking about childcare. And one woman had a very interesting thought about elementary education students, like in, in post-secondary in college, and that, you know, we should have like a childcare minor. And so that everyone that's doing elementary education or any type of secondary education should learn about and have to work, you know, at least do an internship or something, have some hours in early childhood development, just so that they understand. And then, you know, maybe that will spur some interest, but there's just so many different avenues that need to be fixed. There are. Um, and I think one of the biggest challenges that we have in childcare is, um, you know, I think, and I, Joe, I think you're right. It is, 
it is a, the need for the conversation about is child care service or is it an education opportunity? Um, and I don't think any of us would disagree that child care is critically important and that the children should grow and nurture and develop in that setting, um, which to me means that you want somebody in that position who is responsible and is committed to providing that. But the reality is in the vast majority of our communities, your childcare workers, workers are your lowest paid employees in any sector. And so right now mm -hmm. um, you can make more money, have better benefits and have better hours by, you know, working at a local gas station or, you know, working at your main street store or whatever the case may be. And so given that, how do you get childcare workers interested in going into that business? How do you keep them? Um, how do you, uh, you know, how do you incent people? You know, when, you know, to run a, a daycare business, whether you're a family license provider or you're working in a childcare center, you know, it's not a 40 hour a week job. You know, it's 40 hours a week that you're with the kids, but then you've got all the business work you need to do and that side of it. And so, you know, we do need to figure out how we address just the fundamental market structure of childcare. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Are you seeing, um, talking about regulations, I know in years past, there's been more talk of regulations and maybe over-regulation or under-regulation. I haven't heard much talk about that this year. It's more been on the funding front. Is, is that correct? I think so. You know, we did a pretty significant regulation bill um, during the 2020 legislative session. And so I think we're all kind of sitting back to kind of see what the impacts of those, uh, those are. Um, and I think, you know, part of, part of the challenge we have with this legislative session is just with everything being done virtually and not having the opportunity to have as much conversation that it's harder for some of these other issues to bubble up and become, uh, a focus. And with this year being the budget year, I think everything is just kind of naturally focused in on what are we going to spend money on and, and how are we going to spend it? Mm -hmm. Nope. That makes, makes complete sense. Kind of want to transfer into another part of economic development that in rural areas is really being compounded right now, and that's housing. Yeah. Um, wow. Um, you know, I can honestly say a year ago at the beginning of COVID, I really erroneously thought, you know, I was wrong. I thought that the housing market would tank, and it has done the exact opposite. And we already had a tight housing market in greater Minnesota, but now, wow, I, I just, it's amazing to see what home prices are going for in parts of greater Minnesota and, and especially in the Twin Cities. I mean, gosh, I was reading an article about people bidding $100,000 over market value, which boggles my mind. Um, so gosh, and I know that there, I know that there's some housing bills out there. So why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, you know, housing is an interesting issue. Um, you know, as we talk with our businesses, and I know the State Chamber of Commerce has told me they've heard the same thing from their members. You know, when you ask them what's holding you back from expanding your business, growing your business, building your workforce, you know, however you want to pitch the question, the two things that come up are child care and housing. And this is important in greater Minnesota because in most of our communities, if you don't have that worker there to come in and fill your position, you've got to recruit them from outside of your community. And in order to do that, for the most part, you need housing available for them and you probably need childcare available for them. And if you're missing one of those two or both of them, frankly, um, you're not gonna get that employee and then you're not gonna expand. And then when it comes to decision as to what you're gonna do, you're likely gonna move your business or expand your business in an area where you have access to those, to those community resources whether that's in Minnesota or not Minnesota. Um, none of those outcomes are good for any of us. And so we do need to address the housing issue. Um, and you know, housing much like, uh, much like childcare is, is built on the same, uh, same market structure reality where the cost to build is more than what the market supports for that cost. And so if I'm gonna go build a new house in community X and it's gonna cost me $300,000 to do it, well, that house is probably going to appraise at 225 or 250 once it's done. Well, you can't build a house in that situation. And so, you know, that's the crux of our problem. And we've got to try and figure out what to do with it. Um, 
but the challenge is, uh, is how do you get there? You know, the, the house just released their, their, um, their bonding bill proposal yesterday and included in that is a hundred million dollars in, uh, in housing bonds, which is a great program. It's hugely successful and impactful both in the Metro and greater Minnesota. But when you take a per unit cost of $200,000, a hundred million dollars gets you 500 new units across all of Minnesota. It just doesn't make that big of a difference on the total side of it. Now, the reality is you're using, you're not using $200 in bonds per, per development site, but that's, that's the reality of what we're dealing with. Um, we have situations now where, you know, down in, in uh, Wyndham, Minnesota, they've seen huge growth in employment uh, in two of their major employers down there to the point where they're now housing employees in Mankato and busing them to Wyndham every morning and every afternoon. Mm -hmm. That's not sustainable for that employer or for those employees. And so we've got to figure out what we're going to do. Um, you know, I was disappointed in, uh, in the way things came out with investments in housing this year. Um, the, the house housing committee had an additional $30 million allocated to it for their budget targets this year. Uh, the Senate GOP uh, maintained a flat based budget, so no new investment in housing. Housing and child care are the two biggest economic development issues we have across all of greater Minnesota. And to see you know, very limited new investment in, in the housing issue, uh, for me, was a big disappointment. Um, now, how we're choosing to spend those mm -hmm. dollars, they're good and productive, uh, but we simply just need more more strategic and more investment period in, in the housing issue. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I want to go back to talking about Wyndham and Mankato. So I live near Mankato and learning about that. I mean, it, learning that, you know, there's going to be, like you said, people being um, transported every day to and from work from Wyndham to Mankato. And it's not like it's 10 minutes away. No, you're, know, it's an hour it, and a half drive. It is, it is just mind boggling. Yeah. I mean, it's mind boggling to me. And now granted where they're, they're going to be living, it is somewhat of a win-win because it's an old hotel that had gone, I don't want to say in disrepair, but it, whatever, they were trying to figure it out. And so the Port Authority in Mankato made that work, but it, it just, I mean, that's a story that needs to be told more because if we're driving people 45 minutes one way and 45 minutes back, like you said, that's not sustainable and there's jobs there. They need to be filled and it's in, it's in food and agriculture, you know, they're working in the processing plants. And so, you know, those stories need to be told some more um, because what is that for, is it for two years that they're doing this and then they're going from there? I forget. Yeah. You know, that's kind of what they're looking at right now. Um, but the thing to keep in mind is that this isn't just a Wyndham to Mankato issue. It impacts every community between Wyndham and Mankato because, you know, the housing crunch in Medelia is impacted by what's going on in Wyndham because that's where the employees are, are driving through every day. Um, and so, you know, just the, the geographic and regional mm -hmm. impact that is caused by all of this is, is, is significant. Yeah. It, it again, just, it, I, I'm, I'm impressed with the creativity that they were able to figure that out, but it is not sustainable. And I know last week we had a blog post on housing and talking about the housing churn. And um, we focused on Dawson, Minnesota. Um, Pioneer Public Television did a story on them and how there were investors, and I forget how many there were, but maybe six or seven people that lived in town that had lived, you know, lived in Dawson for decades. And, you know, people are staying Play, staying in place. They're, they're aging in place. They're not moving where typically there's that churn where younger people come in, you know, and buy a house and, you know, it, there's rotation and we call that churn. And so this uh, story talked about how these, I think it's six or seven people or couples invested in like a new housing development outside of town. And so that they could create churn, move to a new house and the newer people, younger people could move into their houses. And we were looking at, uh, some people asked us how much those houses cost. And those houses in Dawson uh, were between two hundred and three hundred thousand dollars and $300,000, which in rural areas is uh, quite substantial. 
but it has created that churn and brought more people to town. And so it, it, it's an interesting way of going about it. And it just goes to show that we can't rely just on public or private. It needs to be partnerships and it needs to be creative thinking on housing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, one of the big challenges that we have in greater Minnesota is that um, the housing that we're lacking is more the workforce housing. It's that first Mm -hmm. house for your teacher, for your nurse, for your factory worker, for your main street entrepreneur. Um, And too often the, you know, the, the government programs that would help build housing in a community aren't accessible to those people because they're making more money than would allow them to qualify for the programs. Um, but they don't make enough to afford the, you know, rapidly increasing cost of plywood at Home Depot um, that we've seen over <laughs> the past year. And so, you know, one of the things that we've been trying to do is to get more conversation around how do we invest in, in the specific needs of geographic areas? Um, and for us, it becomes that workforce housing side um, rather than, you know, focusing solely on, on income contingent kind of financing. Sure. And that brings me, I guess, to my final topic that we can round out the conversation. And that's just workforce. It, it still is amazing talking with people around the state, but especially in St. Paul that still think that we have a jobs problem in greater Minnesota, when in fact, we have a people problem. We don't have enough people. We have plenty of jobs, um, but we need the people. And so, um, you know, trying to get that message across to people that, no, we have plenty of jobs, but we need people, but then we need childcare and housing. And so it it all wraps together. It, It does. And I think the thing that people don't realize is that those jobs we have are good paying, good benefited, stable jobs. Um, in communities mm-hmm. where the cost of living is lower than what we see in the Twin Cities. And so, you know, we should be trying to figure out from a state standpoint, how do we create the systems and the structures to encourage economic development and workforce development that addresses these needs? Um, because, mm-hmm. the, you know, if, if you look back through, um, through past recession data, you know, there are lots of great stories of areas of greater Minnesota not being impacted as much in those economic downturns because of the jobs that we have. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, in this, in this latest one driven by the pandemic, you know, we saw our employment downturn, you know, heavily clustered in a couple of, of service areas, which, you know, completely makes sense. Um, but, you know, you will look at job postings in greater Minnesota and, and they're good jobs. Um, mm-hmm. And we need to try and figure out how to get them going there. Because as I said a moment ago, if a, an employer can't find the stable workforce that they need, they are going to look elsewhere and yep. elsewhere may be somewhere else in Minnesota, but it may be somewhere else beyond our borders. And when we lose those businesses, either at, of themselves, or if we lose their expansion mm-hmm. in Minnesota, it's a loss for everybody. Absolutely. You know, I think of, I'm in Wasika County and ConAgra is building a new facility and, and so it's bird's eye and they have been in, in Wasika for decades and it took a lot of negotiation to get them to stay um, there. I, I don't even know half of the nuances in there, but just whether it's environmental or employment, because they ended up cutting with just with efficiencies, they cut about 275 jobs, I believe. But having that company, that international company in town is such a benefit. And hopefully they can grow their um, employees again. But it, like you said, there are people, companies, especially larger companies are leaving the are potentially leaving the state. And so it's important to help people realize that there are good paying jobs. There's all sorts of jobs. I think retraining is an issue too. You have people who are employed in hospitality who may still be unemployed and how can we get them retrained into another profession? You know, how do we work with deed on that, on getting those retraining dollars? So. Absolutely. And, and to me, you know, it comes back to broadband. How do, how do we make sure that everybody has access? To <laughs> it all comes back. Opportunities that they have. 
Um, and, and broadband is a way for us to take advantage of yeah. it. You know, the, the days where you could only mm-hmm. access education by going to where it was located are, are over. You know, there's no reason that whether mm-hmm. you're in Wasika or Oatan or Alexandria or wherever, that you can access whatever trainings you need. We just need to figure out how to make it happen for them. Exactly. Exactly. Well, we'll end the conversation on that. It is March 3rd. Or no, it's not March 13th. It's April 13th. And so uh, it'll be interesting marking this point in time to see uh, what what goes on in the next five weeks. It will be a crazy time, an interesting time, as the end of session always is. Um and yeah, we'll see about a special session or multiple sessions. Who knows? So, uh, gosh, yeah, thanks for coming on again. And, you know, maybe we'll have to do this in the summer once everything is said and done and rehash what happened. Always appreciate the opportunity, Julie. You've been listening to the Center of Everywhere podcast, where we explore stories of rural Minnesotans who are making a difference in their communities. Rural isn't in the middle of nowhere. It is in the center of everywhere.